Um, before I get started, you can see behind, I have trouble with this, the non-mirrored background. The, we have some JCRA stuff and, and I will, I did bring one out, have show and tell. Oh man, that's, <laughs> that doesn't work against that background. Maybe it's no, it doesn't. Got a nice, got the shirt here, got the front is the, the gate closed, of course, and then the back does not work well. There's what the back looks like. Some plants that, that reminded us of COVID. Ooh, this may be difficult because I, I was gonna, I got some, some other things to show people. So I may have to get rid of my, my background here and then people can see my messy office. And there are a couple people who, on the chat, who have already vouched for their, their shirts that they've already had delivered to them. So they're, they're very happy. So keep that in mind. It's something that I think is going to be, that's a lot of fun. You can also, yeah, if you want something different, you, you can get the book Gardening in the South. Man. <laughs> All right. When I start showing plants, I'm going to have to take that off, I think. Yeah, you did last time, Mark. Yeah. But we all enjoyed it, though, when you, when you um, did the plant showing. There you go. So, all right. Let me share my screen here. One other thing before I get going. Today is Day of Giving for NC State. And I'm going to... I'll show you at the end kind of how to how to get there. But if you do want to make a gift, if you if you appreciate what you know, Chris and the rest of the staff are are doing to try and keep everybody informed, this is a good day to do it because this is a day that the the university kind of pays attention to who's supporting what right now. So you can see we've got you know almost four thousand dollars right now from from a handful of gifts. So something to consider. We're happy to take a gift anytime though, but today is, they're, they're kind of pushing it. So there is that, but we'll move on. So, you know, I talk, I give a lot of talks about, you know, plant collecting in Asia and, and things like that. And, you know, a lot of times the plants are things that as a plant nut, I think are very cool stuff that, I'm excited about, but probably nobody who actually tries to sell plants will be excited about. So this is a talk more about some of the things we've collected, some of the things we've seen that may have some, you know, true ornamental potential, something that, that could possibly get into the, uh, into garden centers and nurseries and things like that. It's always hard to tell though, because, you know, you collect something, say you collect uh, seeds from a tree, you know, some plants have, you know, double dormancy. So it may take it two years before it even germinates. And then once it germinates, you know, it has to be grown out for multiple years. Sometimes, you know, with a tree, five, eight, 10, 15 years to really see what it's going to do. And even a perennial, again, it may take it, you know, some seed pops right up and germinates, some takes multiple years, but then you, you know, you really have to grow it out and, and evaluate it and make sure it isn't going to be a pest, but also make sure that it performs well. And then, and then even if it's a great garden plant, you have to try growing it in nursery and see how it does in that way. So, it can take a while between collection and actually being being available. I stuck this in just last minute because I just got this. This is from Plant Diversity. This is this is not the actual cover. It's it's issue for the September 2020, I believe, that this actually came from. But this was talking about the last 20 years of, of what's going on just in China. And you see the, the red lines are newly described species. So you can see they're, they're averaging about 175 newly described species every year from China. 
And this is not the uh, renaming of plants, plant recombination of names, things like that. These are a newly described species, this little blue line, new families, new genera in the orange there. So despite, you know, a lot of work being done in China, so much is coming out that is, that is new, that is newly described. And it's, it's something that we deal with a lot. We, we try and get with the experts and we will, you know, when, when we've collected something and it grows and comes into flower and fruit and we can start really identifying it to, to species for sure, we, we do that. And, and it's, it's not uncommon that something is new. All right. One of the exciting things, if you look in here, is you see the little lines here with a number. Every year it's getting a little bit better with really looking at kind of molecular evidence because some of these plants are, are widespread and can be very variable. And so it's really hard to, to distinguish what is and is not a species. So here's one that I've talked about before. This is, this is an evergreen maple that, and I tried not to put in too many things I'd talked about, but this is one that is, despite being collected in 2009, this is just now, you know, starting to, having some nurseries really start, start looking at it and building up some numbers. So it takes a long time. It's been 11 years since, since, you know, we, we first collected it as seed. And you can see that's the new growth. And this was actually after a cold year that it had uh, mostly defoliated it, you know, but then, then the foliage does kind of does this over kind of a silvery, silvery background. Another Acer that we collected, collected it as Acer Fabry, which is another evergreen maple, but as it's growing, it has not flowered or fruited yet, but I'm thinking it may be a different species. It may be Acer lucidum, which is another evergreen species. And you can kind of see the gray, um, green trunk on there, which is very nice, growing much too close to my house. So I'm probably going to move it this winter. But, you know, I started in a protected spot, much like we do here at the Arboretum. We start a lot of things in the lath house to give them a little bit more protection, and then we'll move them out if they, if they do perform well. But it's been a really good grower. It stayed nice and straight. And the new growth you can see here is kind of red, not, not like the Hong Long, but, but pretty nice anyway. So I'm really looking forward. I hope next year it'll flower. That's, that's my struggle is, do I move it before it flowers or do I wait till it flowers and it perhaps gets too big for me to move? I actually thought it was going to be a little bit more tender than it was. But all of these, you know, the goal is to find a really good, hardy, evergreen maple. Because if we can find one that's solid through the coldest zone seven winters, that'll be a real winner. We're not worried about zone six, but zone seven at least. And Hong Long has been through some, some good cold winters, but it has not, not the, the, the coldest kind of winters we can get. Hopefully we'll get one of those pretty soon. Now on Monday evening, I gave a talk about plant collecting to the NC State Hort Club. And at the end, somebody asked me what what was the most exciting plant I had ever collected? And it was a hard question to answer, but what I eventually decided was the one that I was most excited about, about getting collected and back in was this Litsia auriculata. Litsia is in the laurel family, spicebush, lindera. We have native Litsia here. They're usually shrubby plants, small trees. But in eastern China, 
on this one mountain, Tianmushan, in 2008, I saw this Litsia auriculata. Now this is a young a trunk of a plant. They get to be probably 60 feet tall, some of the ones I saw. And they have these huge leaves, auric auriculata. Oracles means eared. So when you see something that says auriculata, if you look down here, it, that usually means it's gonna be eared like this. New growth is really lovely. Flowers are not gonna be outstanding, I don't think. They'll be most likely green or yellow, possibly white flowers. But that bark and these huge leaves, this is it in the nursery here, and the leaves get even larger than this. You know, it was, it was just a really striking tree. I'd never seen anything like it. And so in 2016, I uh, was able to go back to that same location and collect it. So we have one plant here and Atlanta Botanic Garden has one plant of it from that same collection. Never seen it in the US other than, than that. I don't know, never seen it anywhere in any cultivated collections outside of China. So they've planted theirs outside this year. So we're probably gonna keep ours inside for one more year and, and before we plant it out, but it should be, should be perfectly hardy. But that was a, that was a really exciting find. And, and this may be one that winds up being a good grower for us. Some laurels, some plants in the Lauraceae family are, have separate male and female. I don't know about this plant. I have a feeling it's good, might be tough to, to grow from cuttings, which in, if that's the case, then we really would need a seed of it. And if they have separate male and female plants, you know, unless Atlanta has a male and we have a female and vice versa, it, it may not be one that shows a lot of promise because we may not be able to produce it. But it has been very easy and very vigorous in the nursery. So I, I do think it's, it's got potential. Now, out in front of our, our Ruby McSwain Education Center here at the Arboretum, for many years we've had an Expuclandia. It, it took some damage a few years ago and has, has killed back quite a bit, although it's starting to recover. And that's a plant we grew as Expuclandia popolnia, called the Himalayan aspen. I don't know why Himalayan aspen doesn't really grow in the Himalayas, and it's certainly not an aspen. But there you go. I think we may have it misidentified. Hopefully not, but it may be Expoclandia longus stigmata. But in 2012, in kind of southern China in the Nanling Mountains, we collected another species, Expoclandia tonkinensis. And this is another one we have have growing at my house. We have it here at the Arboretum as well. But it has these large evergreen leaves. The the flower we have we have a another Expuclandia flower actually on the back of our 2020 T-shirt because it's kind of got that starburst shape. It's the Expuclandias are pretty closely related to well, they're, they're in the Hamamaladaceae, so they're related to things like witch hazels and, and those sorts of plants. So it's kind of a, they look nothing like them, but when you see them in fruit and in flower, you can, you can kind of see the similarities. Hardiness is still is still a bit of a question mark with this. Uh, as you can see, I have it in a nice protected spot, uh, you know, up near a wall, but it has grown very vigorously, perhaps too vigorously, because I planted it there to kind of cover uh, the meter box and keep having to prune it from around the meter box. But it'll grow to be a 35 or 40 foot tall tree. The leaves, can get very large, although as the tree ages, they tend to get smaller. Younger trees, the, the leaves can be 
eight, 10, maybe up close to 12 inches across. So with this plant, if it gets too big, what I may do is see how it, how it handles coppicing and, and cut it back every year down low. And what I imagine will happen if I coppice it is it'll flush out new growth every spring and that growth will be even larger than normal. Kind of like you can see right here, I have a, a Taiwanese polonia that I cut back to the ground every winter and then allow one shoot to grow up and the leaves get to be almost three feet across. I think it's just huge, huge, huge. But it's, it's a fun plant to play with. And if it does have hardiness, as very young plants, they were not terribly hardy. We planted some, some small ones out and didn't have great success with it. But with a little more size, they seem a little bit, a little bit tougher. So we're hoping that, that we'll, we'll get something out there. I think it'd be nice to get a few more really broadleaf evergreen trees, things that are truly trees and not shrubs. I think be nice additions to the, the, the landscape palette. Now, this is still a recent one. This is, this is from 2017. This is Maculus. It's another plant in the Lauraceae family, very closely related to Persia, like our native Red Bay, Persia Borbonia, or avocados, Persia Americana. So it was a small to medium evergreen tree. Real, you know, when, you, when you're seeing things in the wild, it's hard to get, you know, it's not like they grow out in the open where you have a perfect head on them. So it's hard to get pictures a lot of times that really do the plants justice, but had nice glossy foliage. And then had these red petioles and big, you know, marble sized black fruits that were just so showy. Got a big seed in there. So it's not something that, that birds are likely to, to eat in there. I mean, think of an avocado pit, Persia, that's how, what their fruits do. But uh, it was a really, I just thought it was just an elegant showy tree. And I think if it, you know, if it grows well and forms a nice head as a young plant and flowers and fruits early enough, I think it'll be flowering. It won't be overly showy, most likely. We haven't seen it flower yet. Some maculus are pretty showy, but it'll do that in the spring and then in the fall have fruit on it. So it may really be at its showiest, you know, right when people are looking to, to purchase plants. And again, I think, you know, a nice evergreen tree would be something worthwhile. It'll be interesting as we're growing these out to see whether it naturally becomes a tree by itself or if it takes some work to do that, you know, if it wants to be a shrub more than a tree. But that's, that's why we, we grow them and we plant them in different locations and try and see what it is they might do. Oh, Sorbus. Every time I go to England or I go to the Pacific Northwest, I collect bunches of different fruits from Sorbus and we sow them out and they germinate and grow and then they die because Sorbus hates our heat and humidity. So while we were out last year, this is just this past fall, we were in an area that everything growing there is just perfect for us. I mean, everything seemed to be just the kinds of things that we could grow. And lo and behold, there is this sorbus with this beautiful pink fruit. And, and the pink fruited sorbus, they're not as showy as the orange and red fruited ones, but I saw a picture of pink fruited sorbus in Roy Lancaster's travels in China way back as an early, as a gardener many, 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 many moons ago. And it's been one of those things that I've just lusted after. So we've collected that seed and boy, they've germinated well, the sorbus dunii. And look at these plants, look at the backs of those leaves. Isn't that, uh, that is to die for. And 
So they, those leaves kind of flutter in the wind, the young growth covered in these white hairs. The problem with sorbus is it usually gets fire blight and dies. But these are from hot, you know, pretty warm, humid areas. So we are really hoping that these are going to be fire blight resistant. We, our plants are still pretty young. I looked at some pretty good sized plants down in Atlanta recently and they've had them out for the summer, planted in heavy clay and those young plants look good. Time will tell if, if you know, fire blight is gonna be an issue with them, but we have really high hopes that we may have a good sorbus for for the southeast one that's that showy both foliage and fruit so fingers crossed on this one uh it's a little rhododendron we haven't identified it yet because it hasn't flowered yet this is a 2014 collection i thought for sure i would get flowers on it this year but it comes out this actually doesn't do it real just it comes out almost screaming pink and then goes this what color is that I, I don't know coppery red burgundy light burgundy and then almost purple and that's what it does just all season long it is it's spectacular but it hasn't flowered so we haven't identified it yet hopefully hopefully we get some in flower soon but I've shared it with some other gardens and other nurseries, and they all are absolutely in love with the plant just from the foliage. They keep asking me what it is. Have you put a name on it? Are you doing? I'm like, you know, send me a picture of it in flower if it get you get flowers on it. Otherwise, I'm I'm stuck. I don't I, I have no way to identify it. But it's one that I think we're definitely going to put a cult of our name on. What we'll probably have to do most of the seedlings look pretty look fairly similar so what we'll do what we need to do is grow them out and then get with the other people that they've been shared with and find what is the best of them you know which one has the best color the best vigor best flowers whatever and put a put a cultivar name on it but i'd really like to figure out what species it is first because we do not know as of yet but it's but it's been a small little evergreen guy so far so Pro maybe ovalifolium but but that usually flowers younger and hydrangeas oh it's so easy to collect hydrangeas and you get a million seed you just collect one head when it's in seed fruit and you know you've got enough seed to, to uh, you know cover a couple of acres and often i will at this point, I'll pass by a lot of them unless it really looks like something different. But but I didn't always do that. And so back in 2009, in Taiwan, collected this hydrangea aspera, or at least aspera type, with big felted leaves. The leaves can grow you know, eight or ten inches long, four or five inches wide, very fuzzy. And it, this particular one flowers over a very long season and is, it has the very best color for the fertile florets that I've ever seen. So these are the fertile flowers, just like our, the macrophyllas we, norm, we, we often grow. These are the infertile flowers, kind of the, so this is a mop head type, but that is a, just a great, great color for a hydrangea aspera. Usually they're much lighter than that. And so this is one that we've really been keeping an eye on. And uh, probably next year, if we don't, probably won't have time to get to it this year. Next year, we'll probably start propagating this one and, and potentially naming it. It really is showy. And it's got, it's, it's, this is much earlier in the summer. It's still got some buds that are opening up. So it flowers over a very, very long period. And you want them us. I, I got to say, 90%, maybe that's too much. 
85% of the euonymus that you can, you can find in garden centers generally, I don't like much. They just don't do anything for me. They're overused. Often the shrubby forms are usually planted in sp spots where they don't do well or they're too big and so they're sheared back constantly or, or else they're hiding, you know, they're, they've engulfed a house or they're variegated forms that are reverting, that the reversions aren't cut out. And it just, they just, it seems like we've found the worst euonymus to, to grow. The ground covering climbing ones are just terrible about getting euonymus scale. But there's a ton of euonymus that, that are not in, nobody grows. There are a lot of tree and shrub euonymus that are gorgeous. This is one, euonymus cornutus, the horned euonymus, cornutus means horned, from 2014 in, on Ime Shan in, in China. It has the typical kind of hearts of bursting flowers, but has these long, those are about six inches long, four to six inches, you know, from smaller to larger. Really stiff, dark, glossy green leaves. It looked like it should be evergreen. The, the leaves were just so thick, they gave the appearance of being evergreen, which we know many euonymus are. I had a hard time telling on the plants if there actually was old foliage on there. But whether it's deciduous or not, I actually, well, I actually would probably prefer it to be deciduous because then the fruit would show up better because the fruit kind of is on the interior of it. But it grew as a, a thick, dense shrub. I, I think this could be just a fantastic addition to our, you know, broadleaf evergreen shrubs. You know, I'm imagining it'll grow in sun or shade. It's interesting. I see, um, I've seen Euonymus cornutus in England quite a bit. And whenever I see it in England, it has a, it seems to have a longer petiole or leaf stalk and a much, much thinner texture. And so I'm not sure if it's different forms that were growing. Some other form was collected and is what's growing in, in the UK from this, or if perhaps I've got the species wrong or they've got the species wrong, or if it's just their growing conditions, the lack of summer heat that leads to a thinner textured leaf, but it is certainly has a different kind of a feeling to it. It's much more open and airy in, in the UK and not, not what these plants that I collected look like. So it'd be interesting again to watch these as they, as they mature and as they grow. Oh, I wish I had a better picture to, to show you this. Viburnum glomeratum subspecies magnificum. Now this is a 2016 again from Eastern China, kind of the Tian Mushan region, uh, Zhejiang province. This was, I have no pictures from the day we collected this because the rain was coming down in absolute buckets and it's hard to take pictures in a pouring, pouring rain. I had seen plants that had been in the, in the U.S. that had been labeled as viburnum glomeratum subspecies magnificum, but this was a different animal. Large kind of felted leaves. It was a big viburnum, a big shrubby plant, but the fruit on it were these big, biggest fruits I've ever seen on a viburnum and just candy apple red glossy fruits. It was just amazing seeing this. And this was one where there are only a handful of fruits left on the plant and it was growing way away from us on kind of the other side of a ravine. And it took 
all the ingenuity we had to figure out a way to reach over to the plant and slowly tilt it over to us until we could grab a, a handful of, of fruits. We've got it going. Co-collectors have it going. Hasn't flowered or fruited for either of us yet, but I think if not next year, the year after, we'll get flowers on it and hopefully get some, some good fruiting too. You can see it's, it's a lovely plant anyway. It looks like one of the big leaf hydrangeas. The leaves, these leaves right now are eight inches by four or five inches. As it matures, those will get smaller, reduce size to probably more like six inches. All right, we're gonna get into a few hollies. Man, the last couple of years that I've been in China, I have found just some hollies that I think, I think potentially could be great plants for our industry. And I'm really uh, stick with the, the ones that, that are non-spiny. It's got to look really good for me to collect a spiny holly if I'm being honest, just, we got a lot of spiny hollies. I don't know how much, unless it looks very, very different from what is being grown in the trade. I don't know how much use there is, but these non-spiny ones like this Ilex shenongensis, this is a holly that's found mainly on Shenanjaya, the mountain. Kind of grows as a upright shrub, a little bit of of carnations, all not somewhere between serrations and just little crenate leaves. You can see somewhere it looks a little bit more serrate and nice big fruit. You know, we're always looking for substitutes for boxwoods, things that are easier to grow in the nursery, things that don't get the diseases boxwoods get, that grow faster, that will recover if they're damaged, those kinds of, of things. So a lot of these have some potential for that. This Ilex sugarokii, variety Breva pedunculata. Kind of see, again, this is in the wild. And in the, whoops, let me get back. In the wild, even it would made a nice tight shrub, which usually plants don't. This was up high elevations in Taiwan, and then the fruit. This is the fruit just getting ripe. It'll turn bright red like this, but it's held on these stalks. And there is breve pedunculata, which short peduncle, and there is longa pedunculata, which apparently is even longer stalks like this, but both are very similar in having these very smoothed leaves, uh, green stems, and kind of nice uh, shrubby habits. If they grow off quick enough, uh, yeah, I think nurseries would be very interested in these. So we're still, we're still evaluating them. And like I said, we'll find out how they do in the garden and you know, then we'll start working with nurserymen on how they do in production. There was another holly that we we really thought very highly of that had been growing here at the Arboretum for a long time. We we had you know gotten gotten some of the the local nurserymen very excited about the, that holly got it all propagated, got it to them. It just, in a, in, the, in a nursery, it grew way too slow. So it has to, you know, kind of check all the boxes um, uh, before it'll really make it, um, make it in the trade. And then, now this one's more of a tree than a shrub. And I've collected this more than one time. Ilex phycoidea. So it's kind of a, resembles a ficus. So you can kind of see where the leaves look like, you know, your, your weeping fig, ficus benjamina, that you would have as a house plant. 
except for this has fruit on it and it can grow very, very dense. This one, you know, and I, they could possibly be misidentified. There's about 400 different hollies in China and many of them are very, very similar. But Phycordia can have slightly serrate leaves like this and it always has this long drip tip. This has a very smooth leaves and but still that long drip tip and, and pretty sure it's phycoidia but you can see how you know how heavily this this fruits and makes just a, a beautiful plant birds seem to like it in china anyway i did not see this bird eating a single fruit he was just hanging out in this this plant bonus points for anybody who can tell me what this bird is there this is in fujian province so there you go. And we've, we collect an awful lot where we have no idea what, what they are. So we'll have to wait and get them to, to flower and fruit and cultivation and, and work with experts. This is another one from last fall, but this had some of the reddest of red fruits that I've ever seen on a holly. You know, you think holly fruits are red and then you see some that are truly, truly red and you realize there's often a lot of some orange and, and whatnot in there. These were pure red. And this was another pretty dense upright plant that we believe might be, it might be a good landscape plant, but time will tell. So getting away from the hollies into more, some more shrubby plants. A few of these I've, I've shown, but Dendropanix pellucidopunctatus. The only thing going against it is its name, but it's this nice mound of, of pale green foliage. Really, I'm really high on this plant from Taiwan. I think it's just a great tough shrub for shade garden or sunny spot. It just, just performs really well for us. We really like it. And Schiffler, as I've talked about as well, but these are, you know, as we're finding ones that are tougher and tougher, I think um, I think we're going to start seeing nurseries really really thinking about about some of these hardy chifleras. Now, I did find at a big box store a chiflera taiwaniana from Monrovia that was being sold uh, here in Raleigh. I did buy one to keep other people from buying a plant that's probably not going to survive for them because it doesn't like our heat. Although I do, it has survived so far. So who knows, maybe they found the one good Schefflera Delavea, Schefflera Taiwaniana. But this Delavea is definitely where I think we need to really be evaluating and looking at these plants. And there's so many really nice forms, and new growth. Oh. Love this plant. I've also talked about Fatsia polycarpa. And again, you know, our plant that's growing in the lath house is really looking to be good. And it's finally of the size where we can really do some propagation on it. I, I'm, I'm hoping we can really, I want to just almost cut it to the ground and take all of the big stems and, and really try and get a large number of it because it's been our best plant. The, this one is one from our 2008 collections in, in Taiwan. Growing out at, at Juniper Level Botanic Garden, uh, the 2008 trip to Taiwan was with, with Tony. So that's one of, one of the collections growing there and has been very good. This is one of the largest leaves of any of the ones we've grown. And then one, one more one. I really put this in to mourn it. This is a plant that I tried to bring back from Taiwan many, many times with no luck. I finally got a plant from the West Coast after multiple tries. I've killed it a bunch of times. So I bought it with my own money, not Arboretum money, and had it at my own house and it was growing well. And this was the year I was gonna do cuttings on it for the Arboretum. And this Sinopanix formosanus, this evergreen shrub, 
in Taiwan grows, you can kind of see this is a kind of a rock right here and it grows right there. It grows on these sunny rock surfaces, almost like a lithophyte in the way that it grows, but it, it obviously hates excess moisture, which is funny because it's it, all around it, there's a ton of moisture. It gets fog banks that roll in, it gets plenty of rain, but it just, it always grows in these very, very thin soils or on very steep slopes. So I had it, it was growing well, and I put in some new sod this summer and had just set up a sprinkler to run in the morning for a little bit to keep my sod alive and didn't realize it was over spraying just a bit into my bed. And by the time I noticed it, my cyanopanix was gone. Just, it took just a few days in rich soil that was staying wet to, to kill it. So back to the drawing board with this one. So Akubas, those who've known me for a while know that I really like Akubas. And I'm not going to talk about Akuba japonica, what, what you know, we normally grow as Akuba, but there are these other Akuba, Akuba omiensis. This is a tree. This is a broadleaf evergreen tree. And we have finally gotten some hardier forms of Akuba omiensis growing for us. We'd always had ones that were just really not quite not quite good enough for us, not quite hardy enough for us. But but our last collection seemed to really be doing much better than than the previous. So these leaves are get they are leathery and will get large. Think you know southern magnolia kind of size and and almost that texture but they'll also get bright red fruits on them if you have a female we've been growing it and they seem to be doing well and you know this is what they want to do they want to grow up as a single stalked plant and you know start branching when after they do that they want to be a tree now you can prune them back and get them shrubbier but but that's not what they what they really ideally want so we're we're testing out several different forms from a couple different seed collections. This one's been kind of interesting because you can see it's got really jagged edges to the leaves. It'll, we'll, we're kind of watching that to see if it continues or if it kind of settles into more of this kind of leaf. Now there is one that grows even taller than this. This one will get can get 18, 20 feet. But there's another one that'll grow 45 feet tall and has even bigger leaves. I've never collected it, but I know somebody who has now, and boy, I'm hoping it's hard. It's called Akuba iriobatrifolia, so the loquat leafed Akuba. And he said he found the fruit on the ground. It was hard to tell what tree it came from because he couldn't even see the leaves. They were so high. He was just finding the leaves on the ground. So very, very excited about that possibility. But if, you know, a tree, a Cuba is not what you're looking for. We also collected in 2012, that's not right. That should be 2016, 2019. Yeah, it should be 19, MWC 19. That's, I gotta change that number. This Acuba albopunctifolia. And here, this in this light, for whatever reason, when I took this picture, this comes across as more yellow than it is. It really is more white spotted on the leaves, especially as the leaves age, once they get past the real new growth. It's white spots and it's a very delicate looking plant, even smaller than than Acuba japonica, and very, very much different look with that that white speckling. It, like other Cubas, are male and female. We managed to get both seed, so we'll get, you know, hopefully get some male and female from seed, but also we have some 
we would bring back some cuttings, which we know are female. So we'll be able to, to grow those out. We had to bring those in through the, the, the USDA headquarters in, in DC, because otherwise Akuba can be difficult to bring in from China. But they were great. They, they kept them alive for us and everything. So it was fantastic. And so now we've got them growing and th these will be hardy for sure. We're, we're, we're just tickled about this, getting this in. And, and the goal is to, to get some of these other species, both to see how they are on their own, but also can we bring in other traits into Akuba japonica that may make them even more desirable uh, than they already are. Another one, Daphnophyllum. Haven't met a Daphnophyllum I don't love. They're usually, you know, usually pretty large shrubs to, to trees, evergreen plants. We grow several here at the Arboretum. We've got some variegated ones, but most are big for most people. This is one, Daphnophyllum, pretty sure it's Calycinum. Hasn't flowered yet, so we haven't been able to tell for sure from 2014 in Sichuan. It has so far proven to be hardy. And this is what the new growth looks like. Isn't that beautiful? This is kind of taken looking straight down on it. The seed that these plants came from, the plants were about four or five feet tall. That didn't look like they'd ever been cut back. And were just nice, full, evergreen shrubs. So if it does keep that size, I think this is, this is another one that's going to be as potential to be really good. Unfortunately, Daphnophyllum are very difficult to root from cuttings for the most part. I've never tried this species. We need to try it, but they're, they're, they can be difficult to propagate other than by seed, which is very easy. So if, if it is hard to do from cuttings, what we really need to do is grow enough out till we know we have some good male and females you know, can we keep maybe one male and four or five females and grow them for seed production that we can distribute to nurserymen. But the jury's still out on that. And you know, the, here at the Arboretum, it's been, we've limited space to, to grow out bunches of things. So we are working, we have, we have finally finalized, we we're getting some lake, some land out at Lake Wheeler the research farm NC State has to, to be able to grow out more of these plants. You know, a lot of these things, we can only grow one or two at the Arboretum, but we'll be able to, to plant out, you know, five, eight, ten of these, of some of these even large trees so that we can evaluate them. We can find the ones that are most disease resistant, have the biggest flowers, are the, the most cold hardy, whatever, whatever characteristic, but you can only do that if you can really plant the plants out side by side and really keep an eye on them. And then ideally, you know, we'll, we'll also be able to move some of those as, you know, landscape size plants back into the Arboretum and, and other places around NC State um, as, as, you know, full landscape size plants. Okay, now I'm gonna move into some, some herbaceous plants a little mushy plants because most of us have more room for those mushy things than than others. This is one we have not identified yet. It's an adenophora, which or these are closely related to campanulas, the bell flowers. This was growing up uh, in 2018 in Gansu, has been a good performer for us so far. It's only we've only really grown it outside this past year but it, it flowers its head off. Little flowers and kind of these open, kind of wispy plants, but I've, I think it's really, a really very delicate plant. Now, most adenophora will bloom in more kind of spikes of flowers. So we're gonna watch this as it grows and see if it matures, if it starts to do that, uh, which would make it showier, but if it doesn't do that, it'll make it easier to identify because there are fewer of them that 
only flower with one flower at the terminals, but it did it did flower a lot. I love these these adenophoras, these little bellflower relatives. I have since the first time I grew them, maybe 20 years ago. They just never seem to really catch on in its nurseries, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's that they're a little bit too delicate looking, although they're very tough plants. I'm hoping maybe this one will be the one. Acerums, oh, I've collected so many Acerum macranth, macranth in Taiwan, and they are all different. And right now we have, we have one, this isn't it. We have one that's kind of like this with a ruffled edge. And I meant to have a picture of it and did not. I thought I had a good picture of it and did not is what I should be saying. That has been one of the best growers for us. And we have another one with this tortoise shell pattern on it that are really, really good that may be deserving of, of you know, being moved into the, the nursery trade. But, you know, there's kind of endless variety. It's an interesting, the ceramicranthum, pretty sure they're all the same thing, but we have some that run and spread and then others that are very tight clumpers, but same species. And of course, you know, the ones that are the, the showiest um, always seem to be the ones that are really tight clumpers and are going to take forever to, to propagate, whereas things like this will spread much quicker. And Another Taiwan collection from kind of the same area, Polygonatum arisonensi. This is variety, variety arisonensi. This has become maybe my favorite shade garden perennial that I'm growing right now. When it flowers, it, it comes up and most, most of the forms have these very almost 90 degree angle stems, flowers in profusion, since the stems bend over, you really get to see this foliage, the purple stems with these creased foliage, and then those flowers are awesome, followed by really showy blue fruits as well. But there are a lot of polygonatums out there. I'm not going to show them all to you, but this is one that's a Sibiricum type. It kind of has four leaves in a whorl and but it will have flowers in each of the axles. Now we're saying Sibiricum type because it looks like a Sibiricum, how a Sibiricum grows, but we haven't seen it in flower. We did see it in fruit, and you see this one has five leaves whirled around there. And then it's got the fruit in all of these leaf axles. So every one of those fruit was a flower. And this plant was from where it emerged from the ground to the tip. Some of these we saw were about eight feet tall. So they either hang down a cliffside or they kind of scamper up through a tree. Some have, have cirrhose leaf tips, meaning they have, they kind of, the leaf tip will curl around and hold on to things. This one that we were finding in this area did not seem to have as cirrhose leaf tips as some, but you can see it does it a little bit. So, so again, it'll be, it'll be fun to watch it as it grows. Another group that I can't pass by and gets too little love in the U.S., I think, are all the Ophiopogons that are out there in the wild. So many of these, so many of them, and they're all so beautiful. You know, people know Ophiopogon as Mondo grass, and they don't like it unless they want to put in a big ground cover. But there are a lot of clumping Mondo grasses, Ophiopogon. These with this long, narrow foliage, these leaves are almost 24 inches long, and then these the, the fruits just hanging down there. Those would have all been likely lavender flowers, but maybe white flowers. And then all that, those fruits, I mean, I just, I think that's gorgeous. And as a little tuft in the garden, you know, we grow, people are growing carexes finally. They're growing the sedges and sedges are great. Don't get me wrong, but this is basically a sedge with showy flowers and fruit. 
just think there's tremendous more opportunity with the Ophiopogons. Um, and by the same token, liriope. Again, you know, we think of liriope as, you know, use it to edge our walks, use it as a, a ground cover. But there's some of these, this, this species is so widespread in, in China. Liriope platyphylla. And it's got this very, very broad foliage. Uh, we've seen some almost two inches across. And then sometimes the, the flower and fruit stalk will be three feet tall these can get to be just these really big clumping grasses. And we've gone to collect it thinking it was a rhodia before and found, realized it was a liriope as we got, as we, you know, when we saw the, the fruit on it. Love it for the shade. There's been some selections on there, but it, it's interesting. It seems like We'll collect these super wide forms, cut the seed, and we'll grow them out, and they never are quite that wide, quite that dark. So it may be that we're growing them in too much light. They're, they're usually, we find them in really, really dark, dark, shady spots. Another of my favorites. They're, so, they're all my favorites, otherwise I wouldn't talk about them, right? Ardesia primulifolia. I am an Ardesia nut, it is my Probably my number one current fascination in plants, Ardesia japonica and Ardesia crenata. This is not a very good picture. Uh, it, it was, again, it was raining pretty hard, but I had to get a picture of it. So most Ardesia are, well, most are pretty good sized shrubs from the subtropics. The Ardesias we grow are either these kind of small shrubs or with Ardesia japonica, a woody based ground cover. That, that spreads. But Ardesia primulifolia just is this flat layer of leaves on the ground and then it sends a spike up of flowers followed by fruit. The leaves are super fuzzy. You can kind of see around the edges how fuzzy they are. I don't know if they always stay this color. My guess is they are more green earlier in the season. This was, it was getting cold where we were collecting and so it was turning purple. It was on a very steep hillside. And this is the only one I've ever seen ever in the wild or, or in cultivation. I'd only seen it in books. So we collected the seed. I didn't, since it was only a handful of seed, we just left it with Atlanta Botanic Garden. And I'm happy to report they have at least two going. And I've told them one of those two is mine um, when they get a little bit larger, but we're going to keep them growing together and hopefully they'll flower and cross pollinate and we'll have some more because this was a real, it was real exciting for me to find this. Probably doesn't excite anybody else, but, but me. Hemiboeas, this was a plant. First time I was ever introduced to this plant was I had a visit to Plant Delights Nursery before I started working here. I came in the fall and saw this thing flowering with these big two-inch tubular flowers fairly late in the fall, September, October kind of time frame. And what on earth is this thing? I could not figure out what it was. Tony introduced me to Hemiboea. This is one of the Taiwan species that we've collected, Hemiboea bicornuta, the two-horned Hemiboea. And it's a pretty good plant. A better one that we've grown outside is Hemiboea subacaulis, excuse me, Hemiboea subcapitata, which has less pink in it, more white, but really vigorous grower with, with much nicer foliage. The foliage on bicornuta Actually, before we saw flowers, thought it was an impatience in the wild when we saw it. But the, the subcapitata has much, much thicker, wider, glossy green foliage. And man, plants of that have thrived this, this summer with the rainfall we've had. I'm going to come back. I'm going to show you another hemiboea a live plant. When I get to the end, some of these things I've talked about, I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Uh, I just didn't, 
it felt like it might get weird trying to stop and start um, all through this. Okay, getting near the end here. So I, I, I gave, when, again, when I gave this talk to the, the, the horticulture club, I quizzed them on this, you know, asked them what kind of plant this was before I gave them the name. And, you know, somebody said a hosta, which could be a pretty cool hosta. And somebody said aspidistra. Somebody said a cuba, but I think that's just because they knew I loved a cuba. This is an orchid, Chromastra appendiculata. Oh my gosh. This is an easy to grow terrestrial orchid. Well, Chromastra is typically easy to grow. It'll have a spike of flowers. Usually they're, they're white or pink, occasionally orange, depending on the type. We don't know what this form is going to have, but we collected seeds. They're growing. It is just, this is tickling us to death to get this in, in production. Now, growing orchids from seed is, is tough uh, unless you have specialized equipment. Really what we do is we send them to folks who do tissue culture and they grow them out like, like tissue culture. And so they can get a lot of plants, but they're very small and they take a while to grow on. But if we can get these growing, going enough that people can then divide them, that's going to be, that's going to be how we're, we're really going to be able to get these out. But I think this would look fantastic in a quart pot. I, I certainly can see, you know, a place like Plant Delights selling it, but I could see it at, you know, higher end garden centers for sure. So on the other side of orchids, so Goodyear, Henry, another orchid. This is an, we have Goodyear species growing here locally. If you know, if you've ever seen rattlesnake plantain, it's, it'd be a little plant, just usually by itself, just a little rosette of leaves that have kind of felted dark green with, with silvery netted veins through them growing in the woods around here. If you've seen that, that's a Goodyear. In Asia, there are quite a few of them. I had only ever seen them in nurseries being grown as these delicate little pot plants. But this good year of Henrii was growing like a ground cover. I've never seen another one growing like this. This was a mat about, a, a pretty dense mat, about three or four feet wide of just solid good year. It looks like it was running almost. Can you see that? That's all seed. Can't bring the plant back, but you can bring seed back really easily. That's um, USDA loves it when we send something like that back because it's you know nice small seed, and these are going as well. So we should we should have this. Can you imagine having a orchid ground cover in your garden? Wouldn't that be cool? And it's so pretty. So it'll be interesting. But this again was up high elevations. Okay, I'm going to finish up with a few vines. First one is a hydrangea, hydrangea integrifolia. This is, this is it growing up a tree. It is all the same thing. You can see some real fine foliage and some broader foliage. It some, seems to do that kind of as it climbs. Sometimes it'll go into this kind of small leaf, kind of like ivies and things do. Most of the integrifolia I had tried to grow in the past had not been hardy, um, but this one we collected in Taiwan has been, has been nice and hardy. So it's got these, it's these big glossy evergreen foliage. It's self-clinging, so it'll climb up a brick wall or it'll climb up a, a tree just fine or an arbor or something like that. There it is in bud. This is before the flower. You can see that big kind of brown bud. And it opens up into these, these lovely mop head flowers. And that's, that's a picture on a fairly young plant. You know, when you see this whole tree with, you see all the flowers kind of through here, all this kind of lighter color. 
part is flowers or, or seed because this was fall. But so this would have been flower, just flowers all up through there. And it's evergreen. So unlike our, uh, the climbing hydrangea, hydrangea um, pedialaris that we grow currently, this doesn't seem to shy to flower at a young age and is, and is evergreen. Consequently, a little less hardy, but it should be fine growing in a wooded area or, or up a wall on a house or something like that. Hmm, gorgeous. Uh, beautiful little clematis that, again, we found in 2017 or 18. Very high elevation. This is in the fall. So it's obviously an evergreen species. But look, it's got these big flower buds in late October when we were collecting it. We thought, what on earth could this be? But that looks pretty cool to have something that flowers then. We got it into flower here at the Arboretum. And look at these, look at these flowers. Look at the petals on there. That's, that's like an eighth of an inch thick. That is the thickest textured flower I have ever seen. Um, the petal on the, I have, I have eaten plenty of uh, oranges and citrus with a much thinner uh, peel than those flowers. This is it in February. So it's the same plant. So we figured out, we're pretty sure it's Europhyla, U-R-O-P-H-Y-L-L-A. So now it's just a matter of growing it out, collecting seed, propagating it, and getting it to more people because we just have one plant. But look at that, that beautiful purple tinge and that flower. Wouldn't that be nice growing up in an arbor, you know, by your door in February? I don't remember if it was fragrant or not, but it is pretty and it does make really beautiful seed heads and it's evergreen. So you can grow it with other vines. That's, I mix vines together whenever I grow them up something so that I have an extended season of bloom on there. So, you know, you can have something that's, that's coming up that dies back to the ground that comes up in flowers in the summer. And you have this in February, something else that's flowering in spring and really give, you know, kind of multi-season interest. Or you can do like I do otherwise and grow your your vines and things through other plants. So in my mind, this would be great growing through a deciduous shrub that would drop all its leaves. And then in, the, in February, you'd really be able to see those flowers on, on the, the plant. Other ones are grown more for the, the fruit, Cadsura coccinea. This is a big, vigorous vine. Don't tell my wife that because I planted it on an arbor in front of my house and I have a feeling it may be a little more vigorous than she is thinking it will get. But it gets white flowers and then these, you know, almost baseball sized red fruit on an evergreen vine. And schizandra. Now this is an interesting one to me. So we collected seed from this, schizandra species. It's very closely related to Cadsura, sometimes called magnolia vine because this I always thought it was, I was always told it was because the fruits kind of resembled a magnolia fruit that was ripening, but they're also very closely related in terms, uh, in terms of the evolutionary scale. These are ancient, ancient flowering plants, just like, just like magnolias are. So it's a lovely plant, it's a vine, it's not overly vigorous, but, but lovely. Obviously that fruit is beautiful. So this is it growing in the greenhouse. This is the same collection, has silvery streaking in the leaves and these dense, the dark, dark purple backs. Well, this is a picture of it just yesterday growing in the garden. Still has the silvery, even more silvery maybe than this out in more sunlight, but there was no purple on the backs. So I'm going to have to pay attention to the one outside next, next spring to see if this is new growth that's doing this or if in sunlight it doesn't, it doesn't do that, but it still has this color. Very excited about this plant. Now it's hard to get 
nurserymen excited about vines because vines are a pain to grow, but there are some specialty nurseries that, that deal with vines. And there's some of them that I really want to make forge a closer relationship with and hopefully get them growing some of these, these plants and selling them. Oh yeah. Asparagus. I've mentioned, if you've listened to a lot of these with me, I've mentioned my love for ornamental asparagus, not so much asparagus. I'm not, I don't love asparagus to eat. I've got to admit it. Asparagus cochinchinensis is a vine, a vigorous vine. This is it. It's, this is, this is where it's all growing from. It is growing up this hill. As much as I try and keep it go cascading over this wall, it'll go up this hill. It is smothering a, an osmanthus and then coming back down. Whoops. This, this one, at least one of these here is, is got to be 20 feet at least. It, I'm going to have to move the plant because it is, it is just too vigorous for the spot where I have it. But growing down a hill, clambering up a tree, it is, it is really a beautiful plant, small white flowers, and then we'll have red fruits. Wherever I've seen it in the wild, it's always just one shoot growing and I always thought you know that's it's kind of silly plant with the one long shoot cascading down a hill but I'm really coming to like this thing in the garden but it's it's a beast beware and I'm going to end up with just just three last plants and and I put these because I, I'm talking all about wild collected stuff but sometimes you also get to visit nurseries in in China and this is, these last three plants are from the same nursery. They have multiple locations around China. They, they were super knowledgeable people. It went with us wild collecting and knew all kinds of stuff, but I was blown away when we went to their nursery. Some of the things they're working with are these yellow fruited Ilex rotunda. Usually this would be a bright red fruit. We've got some of these going. I'm assuming the seedlings will all come up, will all have the yellow fruit as well. But it's a non-spiny holly that, that I really like. And I've never seen a yellow fruited form. But they're also growing the, this is the Taiwan liquid amber, formo, li, liquid amber formosana, the Taiwan sweet gum. And they have these purple leaf ones and variegated leaf ones. And gold leaf ones, except for the gold leaf ones, look so terrible. I didn't put, bother putting a picture in because they were all out in the field and burnt up in the sun. But really, some things that I think could have a great market here in kind of the southern half of the United States where these plants grow so well. Really amazing. So it's not just wild plants. They're doing great nursery work there. And I'm looking forward to visiting this nursery again. Just a word about collecting. I've gone way longer than I'd planned on. I thought this was going to be really fast. You know, this is what the glamorous life of a plant collector looks like. And most importantly, you can leave everything else behind. You can buy anything you need in, in China or wherever you go. And you can buy plastic bags. You can buy paper towels. You can buy new clothes. Whatever you need, you can find if, if you're desperate enough. But the one thing you cannot find are import permits. These come from the U.S. government, and you have to have them with you. That is the only way you're going to be able to get plant back. So we collect all these plants. We clean them. Then we, we have our permits. Then we have them inspected in the country. So wherever we are, whether it's Taiwan or China or Vietnam or Thailand or Japan or, or New Zealand, wherever it is, have them inspected in the country there, get them, get permits from there, a phytosanitary certificate, and then they're shipped to the, to the USDA in Atlanta is where we use, uh, the USDA office we use, and they inspect them there, and then they can move on. But they must have all the correct labeling, permitting, everything. And some of that involves outside of the box, some of it inside, so it's, it's, it's an ordeal to get a lot of that done, but you can do it. 
Okay, I want to end here. I wanted to remind people again about the the day of day of giving. Real quick, I'm gonna show you my desktop, maybe, maybe not. Let me let's see if I can do this. Yeah. So, y'all screen go black? Chris? Are y'all seeing my screen? Uh, uh, we're seeing FileMaker right now. All right. So, if you want to give for Day of Giving, you can go to our website today. Let me click on Day of Giving. And it will hopefully take you to the Day of Giving page. I think it's going slow because I'm on Zoom here. I'm just thinking about it. Arlene's put the link in the chat for everyone. Okay. You Thank you, Arlene. Links in the chat. I just wanted to show everybody what it would look like. And you give heat, you come here and it, it, keep, it will usually send you to this page. So if you just click donate and then you can search if you don't have the direct link, like what Arlene put on there. But if you just have, if you want to search, you can just search for Ralston. It, it wouldn't work when I tried JC, but if you put in Ralston, you'll get JC Ralston here and you can go to that and you can see we've made, we've been, been gifted $4,300 so far with um, 16 gifts. Some of you, know, Judy Morgan Davis and Bob Davis. Judy used to work with us and Bob's a volunteer. Angel Beasley volunteer. So you can be anonymous. You can put a, an anonymous amount. You can put your name. You can put a note in there. You know, I, I gave a gift in, in honor of, of the, my team here who are so amazing, but that's all you need to do. And then you can just click on make a gift and do it right there. So, you know, if you appreciate what we've been doing here every, every week for the past five months and, and I am going to continue into October, but I'm probably going to have to have, if we go all the way through October with midweek with Mark, the last half of the month will have to be midweek with Mark with somebody else because I am, I'm doing my civic duty. I'm going to be a polling place worker and I've got the afternoon shift during early voting. So I'll be working from 1.30 to 8 every day during early voting. So we'll have to get somebody else, either get somebody outside or have Doug or Tim or, or Chris, Chris could do a great one. Or Dennis Carey. We, well, we know all kinds of people who could who we could have do them. So I am happy to answer questions. We did have some questions in the chat, and I didn't do a very good job at answering many of them because these were all so new that they were new to me too. Yes. But Marianne, of course, started off with a question that I just have no clue how to answer. She was wondering how many new species are named in the USA per year? Is that a stumper wow, for you too? I, I don't know that right off. We are certainly still finding new species. What you're seeing more is probably a little bit more of a better understanding of relationships, which sometimes moves a plant. You know, they get separated or put together. So shuffling around, but we are also finding new plants regularly. And there are new plants, there are plants that are not new that I've, that aren't well known. Just, just a week or so ago, I was with Tony Avent in his, one of his greenhouses, not, not one of the ones that with stuff for sale in it. And he, I looked at this plant, had little white flowers over it, little kind of little balls of little white flowers on this little plant. And I said, what's that thing? And he said, that's a butterfly bush from Texas. 
a Texas native butterfly bush. I said, I had no idea. And he said, I didn't either. And I said, so I assume this is kind of a big rangy thing because a lot of butterfly bushes are ugly plants. And he said, no, it's this little mound with these little white flowers that's just cute as can be. Who knew? And that's not even a new species. That's just new to me. But, but there are species being named all the time. That was a pretty neat chart that you showed. I'm looking forward to go back and studying that a little bit. Yeah, I can send you the link for that. Great. Um, and Paul asked, would Sorbus do well in the Wilmington area? Showed. So, as a general rule, no. They would not do well in the Wilmington area. This Sorbus dunii might. That's always been, you know, Sorbus are cool summer plants. Get them New England, Pacific Northwest, the UK, they love it there. But generally they hate heat and humidity. So, you know, this is why this one is so exciting to me. Other questions? I thought so. Uh, Kathy asked a question about the euonymus that, sh uh, that you showed. She asked sun or shade, and she commented that she has one from England. Oh, nice. A um, longer petty thing. So where I saw it growing in the wild, it was on the edge of wooded forested area. So it was certainly getting some sun, but it was growing in a really in a thicket of bamboo. And it was amazing. The leaves were, it was almost completely, it was, what's the word I'm looking for? It was like camouflaged in the the bamboo, the leaf shape and, and everything was exa almost exactly the same. I, pro I My guess is it'll look best in some shade. That's what I would say. John asked, how do you determine if plants you bring in from China or other Asian countries are not invasive? And I suggested that it goes back to look at the um, earlier presentation that you did. Yeah, would be a great thing since you went into a lot of detail on that one. Yeah, one thing I'll say about that is there is a very good, there is a very good, and this is what kind of what Chris is referring to, a 19 question thing you go through that really helps illuminate, helps decide whether something has, has invasive potential. There are lots of lists of things that we can't bring in, things we're not allowed to bring in. But we also, that's, that's part of this process of plants taking a while before they 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 go out you know we can watch them here we have weed scientists who work in the department and the university who work with us and you know that's that's really what we what we work to do is you know we don't want to bring anything invasive do viburnums need a cross pollinator for berries they do best with uh, yeah, there, there's Chris put it in there. In general, they don't, but they will, they will fruit much better if they have um, the same species or something similar to, to cross pollinate. Good. And Maggie okay. asked, do a xylem, which would be a serum, grow in shade? I don't know of one that grows in sun, but I could be easily wrong. No, they, they all want shade. And actually those serum I that so. I showed, those were all growing in a grove of timber bamboo, which is wild. I mean, oh, wow. we were stuck in traffic and on our way up a mountain. And I have to admit, you know, they don't have rest stops in, in China. And I went into this grove of bamboo, this dense grove of, of timber bamboo, you know, this big around because I had to and did not think that there would be anything in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Collecting serums and aspidistra and begonias under these bamboo it was amazing. Wow. And Maggie, Maggie asked, when you go out to Asia, do you go out into the woods? And I pointed out that you go to a variety of locations, but you don't really limit yourself, do you? We you don't limit you ourselves, but, but much like a lot of the U.S., you know, the, where the real, where a lot of the diversity of things that we're interested in are, are growing in, in, wooded areas you know we actually collect very few 
like sun loving herbaceous perennials just because they're mostly in we're mostly in shadier areas so yeah most most of those shade and they're all natives and and but we we don't just go out it, it's it's like you can't go to the you know national forest and just go collecting stuff in there you got to leave it there we team up with people where we're going so we work with people in at botanic gardens universities botanical institutes and they get all the permits for us over there to go where we we want to go just like if they come here I can get permits through the American Public Gardens Association to collect on federal lands. I can get collecting permission to go on state lands and, you know, national forests and state parks and things like that, that they wouldn't be able to get. So we work together as a team. Cool. And Carol and Alexander had a one word question for you about the Cremastra shade. Yeah. Shade, yes. And it yes. looked like you took that in a very deep forest, maybe one of your bamboo forests. Yeah, that's if you ever tried growing any of the Calanthe, Calanthe Sebaldii, Calanthe Discolor, which you can get from from places like Plant the Lights, it'll it'll work with that. And uh, Maggie asked a question that I think is very similar to the question about other invasive plants. So I think uh -huh. that one's already answered. Yeah, well, and I'll speak specifically, you know, how do I know if I'm bringing back a vine, I'm not bringing back a kudzu kind of thing. Kudzu was specifically brought in to be used as a, as a large scale ground cover and for, and for cow fodder. It was, the intent of it was for it to spread quickly and easily over large areas. We have a, we just in general, we all have a better knowledge of, of the, the impact plants can have and are very careful about that. If you read David Fairchild, you know, who was at the USDA, who, who brought in the, the cherry trees to Washington, who was a great plants person, started, you know, the Fairchild Botanic Garden down in Miami's name for him. You know, he really uh, just, just one of the most important people in American horticulture. If you read one of his books where he's talking about being down in Florida, he looks at the Everglades and says, wow, this has got really rich soil. All we need to do here is drain it so we can plant it out with, with things. We know now that draining the the Everglades is, is a terrible idea. So knowledge grows. And so the odds of something come up of a kudzu kind of thing being brought back by somebody who is, who's being careful like we do is, is slim. But we do, we do try that. Acer Hong Long is not available yet. It's, but it is being grown by, by other folks. Let me see, hold on. I almost forgot I had some pa uh, plants here. So y'all can keep asking questions. I'm just gonna show you a few things. I showed that Hemiboea, that it's an African violet relative. This is one we collected in 2019. So this one was quick to come into flower. And since it came into flower, we were able to identify it. It's Hemiboea subacalis, variety Jengsiensis. Jeng so this one has fuzzy leaves and really good flower color. It's hard to see, but it's got little pink dots down the throat. It's been a great grower. It's going to spread. Really excited about this. We're going to be propagating this one and bulking up numbers. Let's see. I mentioned one of my favorite plants is the Polygonatum aracinense. I go back up a little bit. If you can see that, this is how wow. this is. I mean, oh, it's wow. a very big plant. It's got that really nice foliage, nice fruit, um, really thick foliage. You know, I mean, this is, you know, this has been in the garden all season long and it's, you know, has very few blemishes on it. So really a beautiful plant. 
Mm -hmm. Bigger than it looks in the uh, photographs you showed earlier. Yeah, well, there are different. I have some that are much smaller than this. This is a really big form. I showed that Fatsia polycarpa to give you kind of sense of the size of it. And this is, you know, the, the petiole on it is the length of my arm. Wow. And then these great leaves on it. And there was one late flower on that hydrangea. It's looking a little sad now, but you can see that, that really good color on, on there. And the hydrangea aspera. Mostly it had finished flowering, but had those couple and you see the big felty leaves. Show and tell is great. Oh, somebody, oops. Somebody, Kathy says that that Garden Treasures might have the the Acer, the Hong Long. That would be awesome if he has it. Wow. I I had that in our Garden Treasures in an email summer line I haven't gotten to. I think they might have an open house coming soon. I don't know if anyone else knows. But going going back to the questions, Linda asked if she got the photographs of the persimmons that she promised. I did not get them. Okay. Huh. I'll resend them. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure what, what was going on about that. Maybe, maybe copy Chris as well. So maybe, you know, if you get to me and to Chris, one of us will should get it. But okay. I did it. And that was it for the questions in the online chat. Unless someone has one that they've been holding on to. Mark, I noticed on a lot of the plants that were growing up next to the building. Yes. One question, why, why so close to the building? And the second thing is, is when you plant them there and then move them, do you have to replenish the soil or soil arrangements? So why are they planted that close to the building? It's because they're at my house and I am putting them in the most protected spot I have because I'm not sure how hardy they're going to be, how well they're going to do. So, you know, we, we plant them here in the Arboretum as well, but those pictures were when I, I walked around yesterday taking pictures for this. So that's why they're that close, because I really wanted to protect them, to get them some size on them. And I'm actually, Arlene and I were talking about this today. We plant plants where we think they're going to do the best and then in our home gardens and then move them around later. Then we regret what we did and as we have to move them. But so no, I'll dig that out and there, it, no, there won't be a whole lot I'll need to do there because I won't take out a lot of soil. I'll come pretty close to bare rooting the plant to replant it. I, I'd rather get roots than soil just because it's it's a lot lighter and if you if you do that and I have a very loose soil so I can get a lot of those roots out and then when I plant it I'll spread all those roots out and I start a backfill with soil and then I'll I'll soak that in uh, um, kind of mud it in that gets rid of all the air spaces put more soil in do that again and then when I do that I actually even for pretty tall things I generally don't have to stake them at all if I can get enough of the the uh, roots out that are spreading. Any special soil preparation? Well, as I always say, it's always good to prep your soil and amend your beds. Don't ever amend a planting hole. So if I'm moving it to a, mm -hmm. a new bed, I will amend the whole bed theoretically. Sometimes I don't get around to that. And if that's the case and I plant it just in the native clay soil, which I do more often than I'd like to admit, I won't amend that bed. I will, I will top dress with compost at some point, but if I haven't tilled some good soil in, in there, then yeah, I don't have, I don't, but, but generally if I'm, if I'm amending my soil, I'm just putting in down any kind of organic compost and, and tilling that into the top few inches of soil.
Any other no questions? That must be all of them. All right. Well, thank you all. That went a little longer than I had planned. <laughs> Next week, it's going to be about Ecuador, so it will be nothing you can grow, but it is, it is pretty fun. It's a whole different culture down there. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. Thank, thank you. Everybody. See you all next week, or maybe on See Saturday. Next week. <laughs>